what's up y'all who is snoop here y'all look we filming from the house filming from the home office today i'm actually bringing you guys my special subscribers behind the scene with me i'm doing a special interview with kikia the franchiser so she's known for just helping a lot of people franchise their businesses she has a huge podcast and a huge youtube channel and so we're about to go live and you guys are about to see the interview and get all of the behind the scenes footage so um, i'm pretty sure we'll be talking about what made me franchise the two brands that i have remedy spa and salon suites as well as ESCO, um, and just some of the other things that uh, I've had to overcome to get to the place that I'm in today. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Scale. Today, we have a special, special, special episode. Uh, Snoop is here. She is a mogul in many ways, uh, the beauty industry, restaurant industry, and beyond. Um, I'm so excited for you guys to hear her story of challenges, success, and just true innovation. So please like this video, share it, subscribe, tell all the people to come in now, let them know before we get started because it's about to get real, real amazing. Snoop, thank What's you up? so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Yes, yes. I think your story is so amazing. Um, truly an example of what an entrepreneur is, uh, the ability to not only thrive, but lead several different industries. So can you just give us a little brief, you know, background about who you are and just tell us, rewind back to the beginning, like what was your life growing up and how did it lead you to being an entrepreneur? All right, cool. So um, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. Uh, growing up, <laughs> life was very interesting, kind of straight out the womb. Um, my dad came from a really big drug dealing family in Detroit, Michigan. So, um, literally come from a family of hustlers. Um, my mother, her side of the family, um, my mother, they had a lot of tragedy in their family at a very young age. Um, my mother, her father was a, a business owner, entrepreneur. Um, however, he had, uh, just was kind of led down a dark path and he ended up um, killing her mother and, and sister when she was 15. So um, at that point, you know, my mom was pretty much on her own and um, she ended up connecting with my dad. Um, and I have two other brothers, so it's three of us total. And uh, just, you know, growing up on a, the rough streets of Detroit, Michigan, like I said, I came from a family of, of just, I mean, long line of drug dealers and drug users uh, in Detroit. And so we were pretty much submerged around that until my mom decided to leave my dad, maybe when I was about five or so. And um, a little bit after she left him, I think probably when I was about nine or 10, is when we actually moved to Nashville, Tennessee. So I spent a lot of my youth in Detroit, and then I spent the rest of my time growing up in Nashville, Tennessee. And so moving to Nashville was, of course, a very, very different pace than uh, being in Detroit, Michigan. You know, you've got Detroit, Michigan is a urban city, um, literally all of our family was right there in Detroit. So we was growing up, you know, with all of our family. And then we moved to Nashville where we essentially didn't know anybody. And we moved there because my mom really wanted, did not want my brothers to grow up, you know, around that lifestyle. You know, she wanted to kind of cut that generational curse and just kind of have us around something different. And so we moved there. Um, I actually started school when I was three. So in order to just, uh, my mom, she was in school. Uh, 
really, you know, didn't want to pay for daycare. Um, I started reading at an early age and developing um, educational wise at an early age. So she put me in school when I was three. And so when we moved to Nashville, you know, Nashville at the time and really silly is, you know, very white uh suburbial town and so um that was you know a total difference but um it allowed us to be able to you know just focus on our education and get away from the hard knock life of detroit michigan and so while i was in high school so i went to high school at age 12 uh graduated at 16 and so while i was in high school i actually got pregnant um i got pregnant the first time i had sex and I got pregnant with my daughter and um, I was so scared to tell anybody that I was pregnant that I kept it a secret from my entire family. Nobody found out until I was seven months pregnant. And so um, at that time, you know, my mom, you know, she really didn't know what to do. Um, she didn't want me to, quote unquote, ruin my life by having a child so young. And so she wanted me to put my daughter up for adoption. And for me, I knew already at a young age, even when, when I had my daughter, I had her at 15. I knew at a young age that I couldn't, that couldn't be my story. You know, that I wouldn't, I would never be, you know, who I was supposed to be. Um, I, I didn't think I would be able to heal from that type of trauma of, secretly having a child and then putting them up for adoption. So I never signed the papers. So my daughter, she stayed in foster care for the first four years of her life. And that was during the time that I went to college. Uh, so I went to Vanderbilt University at 16. Uh, definitely had, you know, some of the best times of my life, you know, in college, met some lifelong friends, you know, that I still have today. But I would definitely say that I was not focused <laughs> on school and education at all while I was in college. Um, in college, I basically learned to grow up um, and I learned to network. You know, I was very sheltered growing up and in high school, like in high school, I probably only went out maybe five times those four years of high school. So when I got to college, I pretty much was buck wild. <laughs> Um, as far as like, you know, hanging out, uh, partying and just getting to know everybody, you know, I'm, you know, essentially this kid, you know, on a college campus living by myself, you know, for the first time as well. So, um, I would definitely say I got my love for what I would end up doing, which is getting into the hospitality industry and getting into nightlife um, during those early years, you know, in my college years, I started DJing, um, I started throwing parties and uh, just definitely was not focused on school at all. To the point I actually got, was suspended a semester. I was put on academic probation, disciplinary probation, you know, you name it. So <laughs> um, <laughs> definitely bumped my head a lot uh, while I was in college. Um, but I did, you know, being that I, I just was naturally smart, um, I still was able to graduate within the four years with my class. So I went in wow. in 2001 and graduated from college in 2005 with my degree in economics. Um, so I have a bachelor's degree in economics from Vanderbilt. Uh, after I graduated, uh, we ended up getting my daughter immediately from Detroit, Michigan and getting her out of foster care. Um, and getting getting her into into you know our care and uh, it really just you know changed my entire family you know everybody just doted on her you know my mom realized that it was such a big mistake to had had her separated uh, from the family and for me at that time it was go time you know what I'm saying it's like okay well now what am I gonna do because even though we go to college a lot of times people still graduate from college not knowing what it is that they want to do you know in, unless you've done an internship or something like that, or actually have had some experience. You know, I have friends now that have gone to uh, medical school, law school, et cetera, and totally hated it, you know, afterwards, um, and don't even practice in those fields. Uh, so for me, I had decided that I wanted to be a financial advisor. Uh, growing up, my grandmother, 
she was the most affluent person, you know, that I had been around. And she would always talk about her financial advisor and how important it was to save and invest and how this person, this individual was helping her do that. So um, I studied for my life and health insurance licenses, my series, I got my series seven and 66, and I ended up becoming a financial advisor. But prior to do that, to doing that while I was studying, I actually worked uh, as a waitress um, at a popular lounge there in Nashville. And um, the reason why I decided to do that is because one, I knew it would be easy, quick money for one. And two, I knew that for me, I would never be able to do anything like that ever again. <laughs> you know, once I started, you know, working in corporate America, um, I knew that I wasn't going to able be able to go back, you know, and I wanted to do something that was uh, not only making me money, you know, but fun as well. Um, once I did get those licenses, um, I started practicing as a financial advisor and that taught me a lot. You know, I was only in that field for about two and a half years, but it taught me so much. It taught me a lot about the foundation of finances, um, investing, you know, protecting assets, um, trust. You know, I ended up meeting so many different people that were doctors that had a little bit of no money saved. And then there were blue collar workers, you know, that had six figures saved, you know. And so it really taught me that it's not about how much money you make, you know, but it's what you do with it. And so I learned myself, you know, how to invest in the stock market. Um, I learned how to invest in real estate. Um, I learned about, you know, the different life insurance policies that you can have versus just regular term insurance, but, you know, you can have a variable policy where you can actually invest inside that policy and borrow against it later. And so uh, that was a really, really good foundation for me because it taught me about a lot of the things that I still use today, you know, and especially being a business owner, like for me, I can't let my liquid cash go down past a certain level because, you know, having restaurants, you never know when you're going to have to spend it 10 grand or 15 grand, you know, in one week, the walk-in can go out, the ice machine can go out, you know what I'm saying? So um, that was a great foundation for me. And But how I stopped doing it and how I ended up getting out of that is because the I was working for American, uh, American Express Financial Advisors, which is now known as Ameriprise Financial. And so they had decided to close their Nashville office. And so at the time, we had the option of either you could go independent or you could um, or you could just, you know, of course, leave. And so, you know, they gave all of us a severance package, uh, which was, you know, nice for me at the time. I think I was only 22, you know, so that kind of set me up, you know, with, you know, some money that I hadn't had before. And I ended up going independent once I left that company. But. Um, I decided that the corporate lifestyle was not for me. And so I really didn't want to be in corporate America anymore. Um, I started dating this girl and we ended up doing a calendar in Nashville, Tennessee with like, she was a model and we did it with 11 other models. Uh, it was called Wet Dimes, <laughs> Wet Dimes in the Key. <laughs> and so that was literally outside of me investing in property, I ended up buying, I started buying, buying up a lot of property as well, you know, investment properties. But that was really my first business um, was that calendar. So I produced that calendar um, and then we started selling it. We traveled around to different cities, traveled around to different lounges in Nashville and started selling it. And so that was how I ended up becoming a promoter because I needed to get this calendar sold. And so I would have the models um, they would host the parties uh, and, you know, try to, you know, help sell the calendar. And so as I was going to these different lounges and clubs, um, I got to talking to the various owners and, you know, I decided that, hey, you know, the, the promoters, they not even the ones really making the money. It's the owners, <laughs> you know, that's making the money. And, you know, sometimes I don't even see the owner. Sometimes they aren't even in here. So I got the wow idea <laughs> that I wanted to open up a lounge. And so at age 24, I opened up my first lounge. Um, and it was a complete bust, a complete failure. Um, we did everything wrong. Um, the people that I went into business with, they had had lounges before. So I thought that I was making a good choice um, by going into business with them. But, you know, we didn't get the proper licenses. 
um, and do the things that needed to be done um, in order to open up the doors legally. So it was literally grand opening, grand closing. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Yep. So I lost my first 30,000. Uh, with that lounge. That lounge was actually called the G-Spot. You know, I'll never forget it because it's, you know, what got me into the hospitality industry. And, uh, you know, after that, I said I would never, ever open up another restaurant, club, lounge, period. <laughs> oh, your dog in the background barking too, huh? Yeah. Okay. Is yours barking too? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to uh, check it. <laughs> all right. But yeah, you know, so I said that I would never get into doing that again. And so, uh, you know, there were some other little businesses I have that, you know, we can't talk about, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I've done a lot of different things. Uh, but after that, um, I did get a regular job again for the very last time. So when I was 24, I worked for a company where um, we were going around um, like helping people like upgrade their AT&T services. And so... While on a work trip in Chattanooga, um, I was at the gas station and I saw this newspaper that they were selling down there called Just Busted. And so Just Busted was a publication that they sold for a dollar a piece. Um, and it had mug shots of people that had been arrested the previous week. So it was a weekly publication that would come out, have mug shots in there. And, um, you know, me and a couple of the people that I work with, we thought that it was just such a good idea. And um, we decided that we would start one in Nashville. So we literally went back, um, quit our jobs. Um, I had kind of had a little bit of money stacked up. So I helped front the project. Um, and within a month, we had this publication off the ground. Uh, it was called Face It. And so it literally had mug shots of people that had been arrested. But for me... You know, I was embarrassed of the business. You know, I didn't even want people to know that I was behind it because, you know, I'm somebody that's gotten arrested before, you know, not for anything major or anything like that. But, you know, I do know that people make mistakes. And so I didn't feel good about putting people out on Front Street, you know, but I had a daughter that I needed to take care of. Um, I definitely was not about to be doing that little AT&T job for long. That just was not my speed. So it was like, okay, you know, I'll get into this and see what this is talking about. Um, now, the guy that I was doing business with, he was from Detroit as well. And, you know, people from Detroit are absolutely some hustlers. And he started trying to hustle me. <laughs> so... <laughs> He uh he he changed the you know started changing the bank accounts uh information the login passwords and all that stuff and basically just started stealing you know within two months into the life of this business and um you know the first time I had a conversation with him and I'm just like look man you know I'm a single mother like I need all my money I'm the one that put all of the money into the business in the first place you know what I'm saying so. Gave him a chance to correct himself, um, but, you know, once a thief, always a thief. And so within, like, the next couple of weeks, um, I ended up just totally stepping away from the business and letting him have it. And I just realized that for me, no amount of money was worth my piece. And so um, I was still doing what I was doing on the side, so I still had some, some more money. And I ended up going to chattanooga tennessee and starting my own publication there and so uh, from there i was very successful in chattanooga but you know i was having to drive there once a week you know drive there drive back um i mean i had plenty of nights of sleeping in my car you know just to try to save money while i'm in chattanooga you know and not spend as much um, to not go, you know, um, against, you know, my operating expenses. So, you know, or, or I, sometimes I would stay in cheap hotels or really motels. I remember staying in a motel and waking up with bed bugs all over me. Um, just all kind of stuff <laughs> to, to get that business going and to start that business. But um, the, end, the business ended up being, you know, um, pretty successful. I ended up having um, that newspaper company, it was called Caught Up. And so I had that publication. I had it there in Chattanooga. Um, I had one in Knoxville. Um, I had one in Western Kentucky, one in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And 
one in Pensacola, Florida. Um, I'm still living in Nashville at the time, you know, driving around to these different places, you know, just delivering the paper. Um, it was a very easy business to set up, you know, because pretty much you just either go to the website or contact the jail and get the mug shots of the individuals and then get a graphic designer to lay out the paper for you, have it printed, take it to the stores, they sell it and you go pick your money up. Um, but it was it was a lot of footwork, you know. And once again, it wasn't something that I loved. And so uh, within a, the couple of years of having that newspaper, um, I really just grew tired of living in Nashville. You know, um, it just it just was not a city that was for me. And I had decided that before I got too much older that I wanted to leave Nashville and move to Atlanta. Um, I ended up coming to Atlanta that year for Labor Day weekend. At the time, Labor Day weekend was something much more than what it is now. Um, Pride was off the chain. You know, they had Luda Day weekend. Um, so it was just, you know, a, a, a really fun, exciting city, but with a lot of business opportunities as well. So when I came here for Labor Day weekend, which is generally the first weekend of September, I decided that I was going to move to Atlanta. And by December, I was a resident of Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> And so um, I let my daughter stay in, Na in Nashville for a year with my mom so that I could just, you know, get acquainted with the city and um, hang out a little bit. <laughs> and so anyways, now in the meantime, I still have this newspaper company, but I'm enjoying Atlanta so much. I'm really not going to go check on the newspaper company like I should. Um, I'm keeping in touch with the manager. I'm, I'm doing everything that needs to be done. I'm paying for everything. Um, and then I had started an edition here in Atlanta, you know, so I'm, I'm a little bit busier, you know, working the branch here. And so long story short, um, the manager ended up stealing the business from right up under my nose. Um, he had, there, there was a, a, a name and I don't remember it because this is like 15 years ago, but there was a name that he wanted me to change the paper to. And, you know, I'm like, no, you know, it's already branded, it's caught up, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, he was the one that the store owners were more familiar with because he was there running the business. And so long story short, one week, it was one week in particular that literally my entire staff just quit on me, you know, from Monday. So starting Monday, it was a lot of people that were um, delivering the paper and, you know, picking up, you know, the money. Um, then Tuesday, the graphic designer quits. And by Friday, you know, he quits. Um, and then I also don't get any of the proceeds, you know, from that week. So I, I you know, the following week I get up, I go to um, Knoxville to see what's going on. And in the first store that I go to, they no longer have my newspaper on the counter. They have his on the counter instead. And so they've decided not to carry mine and they're just going to carry his paper. And so, you know, with that being said and done, at that time, I had just, I just decided to fold, you know, I decided to fold the company because one, it wasn't something that, like I said before, that I was passionate about and that I loved anyway, number one. Um, number two, I knew that I could not compete with him because I was living in Atlanta. You know, he's in Knoxville and he's closer to all of these places, you know what I mean? And so... Um, and I was only making maybe once it was all said and done, you know, expenses and stuff, I was only making about $65,000 a year, you know, with that business. Um, I only had to work maybe a couple days a week, you know, but, um, it, it wasn't like I was going to become a millionaire, you know, from this newspaper company. So I ended up deciding not to do it. And, um, you know, really at that point, um, uh, my daughter had, had just moved down here to Atlanta. And at that point, you know, I literally had to start over from scratch. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, now, luckily, I had a house that I was flipping and I got down to about my last five hundred dollars and somebody offered me a cash offer on this house. Um, generally, I wouldn't have took it because I was only going to make about five thousand dollars from a house that I had been working on flipping for three months. Uh, but it was the very first offer that came up and I knew that I needed to liquidate my money. And so I went ahead and sold the house and me and my girlfriend at the time, we um, ended up purchasing a party bus company together. And so 
I ended up doing that, and and with that business is how I made my first hundred thousand dollars. Was with this party bus. Company. How old were you at that time? Uh, I think I was maybe about twenty seven or twenty eight at that time. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember when I was working as a financial advisor, and and uh, you know, they would always say that it's always hard to make your first one hundred thousand. But after you make your first 100,000, then, you know, it's easier to, you know, see more. So um, after that, still had the party bus company, but I used to actually drive the bus on the weekends. And I hated that. You know, I hated having to be sober up front, driving around a bunch of drunk people. Uh, but once again, you know, I, I stayed in it until I found something else to get into that I was passionate about. And so within a couple of years of having this party bus company, me and the young lady that I was with at the time, we decided to part ways. And I ended up moving to um, Auburn Avenue to these apartments, these brand new apartments that were built on Auburn Avenue, um, kind of like in the Edgewood area here in Atlanta. And um, I was staying over there. And right across the street, there was a spot that was for lease. It was a really small spot. I mean, it wasn't even a thousand square feet. And I ended up applying for the spot. At the time, I had terrible credit. Um, you know, I had cash, you know, but, uh, but, but I had terrible credit. And, you know, my motto before I knew what I knew now, I used to always be like, oh, I'm good, you know, because I got cash, you know, cash is king, you know, and it's like, no, <laughs> you know, you don't want to run through your cash, you know what I'm saying? Having good credit helps keep the cash in your pocket. But anyway, so I applied for the, the spot. Um, luckily, I ended up getting it, even with, you know, my bad credit score. And I ended up turning that spot into a place called the Hookah Hideaway. Um, so that was the first lounge that I had here in Atlanta. And I mean, it was small as hell. It was, like I said, less than a thousand square feet. I ended up getting the side right next door to it. Thank God, which gave us maybe like another 500 square feet. <laughs> um, but anyways, we started doing after hours and staying open till 6 a.m., which wow. not many places were really doing that here at the time. And how I was able to get away with that for five years, it is just the grace of God, because <laughs> I don't know how we never got shut down, um, staying open till six o'clock in the morning, because literally you would come by the hookah hideaway on the week, on the weekends, four or 5 a.m., and it may be 200 people on the street, no lie. Wow. <laughs> and so um, that, that was my first spot here. You know, I talked myself into getting back into the hospitality industry. I just felt like it, you know, kept calling my name, even though I had that first spot when I was 22 and said that I would never get into it again. And um, that place was wildly successful. And, um, you know, I ended up after having the hookah hideaway, um, I ended up opening up another little spot in Macon called Posh Ultra Lounge, um, which was a upscale lounge that I did with two guys. Um, I did not enjoy that partnership, you know, Three, three is just too much company. You know, they were two people that had went to went to high school and college together. They were best friends. Um, they wanted to do business with me because I had the expertise. They had none. And then they did not want to listen to me at all. So they were making just frivolous mistakes um, that, you know, I had the experience to help us avoid, you know, but again, you know, they didn't want to listen. So I, I ended up asking to be bought out of that partnership and was able to do so. And so also at this time, I had started traveling for the for the very first time because I was always just taking care of my daughter, you know, working, owning businesses. And so I had went to Jamaica. and be, But before I went to Jamaica, I had applied for another lounge on Peter Street. Um, I had always wanted to open up something on Peter Street because I used to live in that area when I first moved to Atlanta. So... I applied, applied for the lounge on Peter Street, and while I, when I got back from Jamaica, I actually got held up in customs. Um, a customs officer grabbed me as I was coming, coming through customs, and uh, they ended up informing me that I had a warrant for my arrest in Nashville, Tennessee. And they were like, you know, do you know what this is about? And I said, you know, no, you know, but I used to live in Nashville, Tennessee. And so anyways, long story short, 
with that newspaper company, when I didn't get the last of those proceeds, I had already wrote the check to the printing company for the next issue of the magazine. And so, you know, I just shut the business down. Well, you know, some people don't forget about their money, baby. So <laughs> they have filed a warrant out on me. Now, here it is five years later, I think it was, or like, or, or no, I think it was three years. It was three years later. Three years later, I'm getting arrested for this unfortunate incident that where somebody was stealing from me. But I guess in, in turn, I ended up stealing from the printing company. So they, they filed a warrant. The amount of the check was $5,003. So it was over $5,000, which made it a felony. So they ended up arresting me. Now, at the time, you know, I'm successful. I turned my life around. I got where I'm on in Hookah Hideaway. You know, I'm trying to open up another lounge and, you know, finding myself in some mess. So they end up calling the police department in Nashville and asking, you know, if they want to come get me or if they should let me go. And Nashville said, oh, no, we're going to come pick her up. You know, um, you can, you know, file the paperwork to have her extradited. So, um, I, of course, am just devastated. You know, they're telling me that they could take up to 30 days. They have up to 30 days to come pick me up. You know, so I'm talking to my lawyer. Um, I'm also talking to the realtor that I had put in the application with for that spot on Peter Street. And so one day, I I'll never forget it. I was super down. I'm, I'm in jail talking to the realtor. He don't even know I'm in jail. <laughs> and, you know, I'm asking him, you know, for an update on the spot that I had applied for. And he was like, you know, he was like, well, the owners, they don't really want to turn that. They don't want that another lounge to be in there. They're going to do something else with it. He said, but there's another spot on Peter Street that's available. He said, it's already kind of built out a little bit and it's owned by a very well-known rapper that's from Atlanta. And he's actually heard about you and he would like to do business with you. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is a, a, a turn. <laughs> And so um, uh, I was like, you know, well, who is it? And uh, because, you know, one, I'm not a celebrity struck, struck in person at all, you know, period. And secondly, you know, you can't do business with everybody. And so anyway, you know, I asked him who, he, who it was and he said two chains. And I was like, OK, you know, I can do business with him. Now, at the time, I'm not thinking that it's really going to even happen. You know, here it is. I'm in jail, um, down on my luck. You know what I'm saying? And I've never met this man. You know, I'm just not thinking that he's going to open up a restaurant with little old me, <laughs> little old Snoop that he's never met before. And so, um, but anyway, it gave me a little motivation, you know, in, in my time, you know, of, of weaknesses you know, my time of being down. And so uh, literally after having that phone call, four days later, they came and picked me up from Nashville, the police department, took me back up to Nashville. As soon as I get up to Nashville, the jail says, oh, the charges are dropped. <laughs> so I literally sat in jail for two weeks for nothing. For nothing. Um, but I get back to Atlanta and Lord and behold, within 48 hours, we had this this meeting, uh, myself and Two Chains. He actually came to the Hookah Hideaway, this small little spot. I remember just feeling so insecure because, like, we didn't even have like a real kitchen. You know, we were frying chicken out of deep fryers and, you know, just making it work. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I just said to myself, you know, well, I'm just gonna show him the numbers, you know, and show him what I'm doing here. Um, and that's what I did. And you know, him and I, we hit it off. Our personalities are very similar. And uh, he basically said, you know, well, you know, if you can do that with this little spot, you know, I know that you can do even more, you know, with something else. And so literally immediately after that, uh, we went to go look at the building that he had, which we would later turn into Escobar um, at 327 Peter Street in Castleberry Hills. And uh, we took our first little picture outside. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's really been history, you know, ever since, you know, since then. Um, I've literally become a multimillionaire, you know, from that brand. Um, I've been able to just do so many different things, you know, start my remedy spa, salon suites brand. I franchise both of those brands. Between both of those brands, I have, um, you know, over 14 uh, salon suites and restaurants, you know, throughout the East Coast of the country. Um, I've got a luxury car business. 
Um, I do my salon suite consulting. I have a huge consulting program, uh, one of the largest in the country, salonsuitemastercourse.com. Um, and just have been, you know, blessed to do so many things. You know, I was able to do so many things for my daughter. I actually lost my daughter about a year and a half ago. So um, that, you know, was, you know, really life changing um, because before then, I mean, I was just rocking and rolling, opening these businesses up. And that really just taught me that life is so short and it's not just about business, you know. So um, since then, I've really slowed down a lot. Um, I, I think like, you know, for the first year, I really was just, I really was just, um, you know, just a shell of myself, you know, like um, I didn't even go to my restaurants probably for like a good two or three months. And um, it was difficult because I had already sold the franchises, you know, so I had to show up, you know, I had to help these people get open, you know, even though, you know, I felt terrible each and every day, you know what I mean? So um, that has been different, you know, just learning how to still show up and work through adversity, you know, how to still be able to lead people, you know, even when you don't feel the best, you know, every day. Uh, but that's the majority of my story. You know, there are some other little little parts in between. You know, most people know I got married to 22, 22. Um, now I'm going through a divorce as well. Um, caught my my uh, former wife, uh, went through her phone. She was talking to four, five, six different men. You know, she suffers from various addictions and I guess it's just sick in the head. I don't know. But um yeah, so life has been life been. <laughs> but, you know, um, I've been extremely blessed. Um, and, you know, it, it just is what it is. You know, we all have our story. So, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank um, you. I appreciate that. It's something that you can't even um, fathom, the, the loss of your child. I can't even imagine. No, it's literally the worst thing that can happen to a person. So with that said, right, like how do you even muster up the strength to show up considering the things recently that you've gone through? Um, because many people stop and don't, they just shut down and they aren't able to proceed. Like how do you do that? Um, it's, it's, it's been extremely difficult. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's been plenty of days that, you know, I'm just sleeping in a dark room, you know, taking sleeping pills. Um not wanting to do life, you know, but, um, I do have a very loving, supportive family, um, especially my mother. Um, I have a, a really good support system and my friends and, um, you know, I just, I know that my daughter would not want me to allow her passing to, to destroy my life or to, um, you know, take away a lot of the things that I've worked hard for. Wow. What what a blessing you are to us all because we can complain about not wanting to show up, but when we look at your strength, it's almost impossible um, to give up. So for real, that's... I, I, this, I mean, you know, I got too many people counting on me, too many employees, you know, <laughs> so many people I coach and mentor, you know, so, <clears throat> you know, I take my time for myself, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, I still got to do what I'm, do what I was put here to do. Yeah. Your strength is definitely something admirable for sure. All right. So uh, your, your sweets, mm -hmm. how did you get into that? Um, I got into the salon suite industry. Uh, <clears throat> there was a girl that I was friends with and she had actually wanted me to open up a salon suite with her. She introduced me to the salon suite business. Um, we were more so like associates, but uh, she was just telling me that it was a really good industry to get into. I was looking for something else to to diversify my money and invest in something that would be um, <clears throat> something that would be good daytime money. And uh, she and, and like I said, she wanted me to invest with her, but you know, I just felt like. You know, I'm not going to be busting down, you know, this little bit amount of money. You know what I'm saying? You can do yours and I'll do mine, you know. And, and But thank you, you know, for putting me on to, you know, this opportunity. 
Um, but yeah, so that was how I found out about it. And then I just started doing my research. Um, I do not wash or do anything to my own hair at all. So when I was getting my hair done, I was always going to salon suites as well. And so I, I just started looking more into the concept and just saying like, okay, this is basically a real estate business in the beauty industry. And at the time when I got into it, which was about five years ago, that was when I opened up my first location. Um, there was not many salon suites at all, you know, in Atlanta, Atlanta is an extremely oversaturated city when it comes to salon suites. I always tell people, I'm not helping nobody else open up a salon suite in Atlanta because it's oversaturated. It's not what it used to be. Um, there's still a lot of different areas that have opportunity though. Um, I just don't feel like Atlanta is one of them anymore. A lot of things are oversaturated here in Atlanta, even restaurants, you know, you still, you, we probably got 3000 restaurants here and it probably five are opening up tomorrow, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, so that was how I got into that industry. And then, um, in 2020, the, the coaching and course industry became huge. You know, when the pandemic happened, I, I remember telling everybody, man, the internet and social media is going to just blow up even more because everybody is going to be at home with nothing to do. People are just going to be on social media all day long. And so a friend of mine, um, Marcus Barney, he goes by him 500 on Instagram. He had hit me up. He was like, Snoop, you need to do a course. He was like, you already got a platform. This is what I'm making from doing this. You know, you already enjoy coaching and teaching um, and, you know, empowering people. You know, you, you definitely need to do a course. And so I ended up hooking up with a girl that's also from Detroit um, and got her to run my ads. And she was telling me, cause at the time I, I probably, once he told me that I went and I filmed five courses and she was like, no, you just need to focus on one, focus on the sal salon suite course because nobody else is doing that right now. And I'm um, so thankful I've done that, you know, because since then, you know, I've, I've been able to help, you know, over 500 people, you know, um, open up their salon suite businesses. I've got my inner circle program where we help get your credit fixed, help you get the funding, um, and do, you know, our weekly and bi-weekly coachings as well. Shout out to my stepdaughter that just joined the chat. <laughs> She's 14, so I feel honored. Oh, wow. <laughs> Scarlett, wise, shout out. No, that's so, you were one of the first, yeah, I feel like to, to do the whole salon suite um, model and speed, you know, of action is very important when it comes to like being one of the first. And so, um, kudos to you for seeing, I feel like throughout your journey, you've seen good things and you ran with it fast. And that's how mm -hmm. you, that added to kind of your success. Yep. And then the thing is too, is, you know, you always have to know when it's time to pivot as well. You know, oh, those things get, say old, that again. get oversaturated, <laughs> you know, shit, I'm looking to see what I'm about to get into next, you know, because, <laughs> you know, um, that's just how it is. You know, it's just like, that's like, I always tell people, so like, like, for example, the old cable companies, you know, they used to only sell cable, right? Then they started selling internet and they started selling home security. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's like, you have to add more and more branches to the tree. Yeah. And so, okay. So what are some effective strategies that you would give people um, that have helped you scale without giving away all your secret sauce, but just like simple things because you had a very deep, well grounded background in finance and most people don't. So what are like some tips that you could give small business owners to just, I mean, fail? well, one, you have to get the knowledge, you know what I'm saying? It's so different now because when I was coming up and getting into business, you know, I had to teach myself. Um, there weren't courses and stuff like that, that you could, that you could take, you know, and if you've taken a course, you have to make sure that you learn it from the right people. You know, some of these courses are like cookie cutter courses. And even if you take it, you still aren't prepared to open up your business. You know, um, I've even, you know, at this big age and, and this, you know, part of my success, you know, taking mentorship programs, you know, from other people that are in places, you know, that I want to be in. Um, so the first part of it is getting the knowledge, you know, doing the work. Um, the second part is, you know, definitely having the um, financial background, you know, and I'm not saying just just the finances, but the financial background, you know, if somebody give you one hundred thousand dollars, you need to know what to do with it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people will blow through one hundred thousand dollars. You know, you see people get 
um, settlements, you know, from car accidents and all type of stuff. And within a month, the money is gone, you know. So uh, once you get the money, you know, you have to know what to do with it. Can you hold for a second? I'm going to let this dog out because he is going crazy and I don't want him <laughs> to, okay. uh, to continue okay. <laughs> and so to so I'm so glad that my dog was really stressing me out. So I'm glad I'm not the only one. I'm like, no. <laughs> this I dog is so freaking spoiled. Get down. Get down. Get down. Okay. He actually is my daughter's dog. I gave him to her for her 21st birthday. So now I have a dog. <laughs> oh, man. Someone mm -hmm. said, um, is, is Snoop a millionaire? Like, no, she's a multimillionaire. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, guys, listen, I'm very specific and strategic with who I bring on the show. So if you don't, if you have no idea, I, w I just want you to Google uh, Snoop. <laughs> I just want you to Google our guest so you can really make sure you really lock in and, you know, ask any questions and just really take these stories seriously because so many of us give up because of obstacles. And when you hear someone's story, you realize success is really just not giving up. That's all it is, no matter what happens. And so that's why Snoop is just so incredible because, you know, so many things have happened. She has not given up. And that's why, you know, she's here where she is. Um, okay. So this is a fun question. We've been a little okay. happy. How do you balance your personal life with managing multiple business ventures? I mean, I'm actually at the point where my personal life comes first now. Um, I've given yeah. up so much of my life to my businesses. Uh, so I feel like now it's my time. You know, if you follow me on Instagram, you see I'm traveling a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, that's one thing that actually helps with my grief. Um, it's yeah. just it's just to, you know, be able to travel and move around. Um, I was blessed enough to meet somebody where I could buy a companion pass from them. So that helps, you know with some of the costs, um, you know, cause I'm still not, even though, you know, I've been, you know, blessed enough to become successful and have the finances, you know, I'm still, I don't, I don't just throw my money out the window, you know, so. <laughs> Hello, did you guys hear that? <laughs> That's key. Yeah, but yeah, so, but prior to, um, I still was very big on having balance, you know, especially, um, because I had my daughter, you know, so I was always looking to set up more passive things that I could spend more time with her. And I wanted to get her involved, you know, in the businesses more. But when it comes to having balance, and so just even with my schedule, I schedule everything, even personal stuff. Um, that way, that, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> that way I make sure that, you know, I have that I have time to do everything. You know what I mean? So it's like if you just only schedule the business stuff then you're going to forget some of the per personal things, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, I make sure that I prioritize everything. Yeah. All right. Listen, what's next for you? It seems like you've reached high, the highest levels of success. So like for, for you, what's next? What are you uh, trying I to accomplish? I've reached the highest levels of success. There's still some things that I want to do. Um, with my ESCO brand, I definitely want to sell more franchises. Um, same with my Remedy brand. Um, but I definitely want to slow down. I don't want to do anything anymore that's hard. My days of working hard are behind me, baby. <laughs> um, I, I want to get a place abroad. Um, I would like to open either a restaurant or a small boutique hotel on one of these islands and um, just live life. I love that. So my last question would be, what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs who are trying to get into the service or beauty business? If there's anything you could give them, what would it be? Uh, young entrepreneurs that's, that's just trying to get into any business. Uh, number one, you have to believe in yourself. You know, continue to look at people like me that have just been through so much, you know, and it's. People say this all the time, but it's so true. If I can do it, so can you. You know what I mean? There, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no better than anybody listening here. You know, um, I just, you know, made sure when I had these opportunities that I was able to take advantage of them. That's just like when I met Two Chains, I would have never been able to open up a restaurant with him if I was not financially prepared to do so. Um, you know, one of the biggest things as a young person that you can make sure that you do and keep up with is your credit. 
your credit is the key to opening up so many doors for you. Because literally, if you have a 700 credit score, I can help you get the money to open up any business that you want to open. Uh, when it comes to getting into the two, in, two of the industries that I'm in, uh, the restaurant industry, make sure is one that you really want to get into. It is one of the hardest industries to be in. You have to pay attention to every single detail. Um, it can be very hard to keep up with, you know, and then you have to decide, you know, all of my restaurants, at least for the first year, I was there probably every other day, you know, so which is why I haven't opened up anymore <laughs> because I'm not making that commitment, <laughs> you know, so, um, <clears throat> You know, you have to make sure when you're getting into industries that you've fully researched them and you know what that sacrifice is going to look like because sacrifice comes before success, even in a dictionary. Well, if that wasn't a bomb, I don't know what was. Okay. <laughs> is there anything you want to leave us with that we haven't mentioned? Uh, just for me personally, you know, I do have a book that's being written right now about my life. Um, so that's going to be coming out. It's entitled Who is Snoop? Um, looking to do, I'm looking to get into, you know, film and, and movies and, and do some things, you know, and, and that industry. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank, you know, everybody that's been supporting me. Um, and especially, you know, since, you know, losing my daughter, you know, just a lot of the messages, um, that I get in my Instagram, the emails that I get, um, the gifts that I get, you know, to my restaurants, you know, from people that have never even met me, it is definitely, um, just so touching, you know, to me. And so I truly, truly appreciate it. Um, anything that anybody is interested in, any of my programs, my mentorships, my classes, anything business-wise, I'm on Instagram to do business. So anything business-wise, all you have to do is click the link in my bio and it literally has all of my websites and everything on there. So definitely looking forward to connecting with you guys. And what's the link for people who don't have Instagram? Uh, well, okay. So if you don't have Instagram, you can go to dhguniversity.com. You can go to salonsweetmastercourse.com. And you can hear more about my personal story at whoissnoop.com. Love it. Yes. Listen, Snoop, thank you so much for joining us. Your story is just amazing. And it's, it's just inspiring. Truly, truly, truly. Um, you definitely need a documentary about your life <laughs> story. Oh, it's Maybe, it's yeah, it's so dope. Mini series, whatever. But I appreciate you sharing, you know, such vulnerable times with us. I know it's not easy. Um, and I just want to say, God bless your daughter. I know she's watching over you. It's nothing like having angels, you know, helping direct the wind for ourselves. So, yeah, um, we'd rather have still had her here on Earth, but I know, yeah. I know. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for having me. I appreciate you. It's so nice to meet you. Yes. Check her out <laughs> at who is Snoop on Instagram. Okay, guys. Yeah. I will see y'all next week, 7 30 PM EST for thank another you. episode. Thank you so much for tapping in. Bye. Yo, what's up y'all? Just finished an amazing interview. <clears throat> I never get tired really of telling my story because, uh, <laughs> You know, I just been through so much, man. And um, I'm definitely, you know, blessed to still be rocking and rolling, um, to still be um, performing, you know, at the level that I am, especially with uh, some of the things that's gone on within the past couple of years. Uh, just wanna say, I appreciate all of my followers. Um, I appreciate all of my subscribers. You know, y'all really mean more to me than y'all can imagine. And like I mentioned on the, inter on the interview, um, I do have the documentary coming. Um, I got the book coming, Who is Snoop? So, so stay tuned for that, y'all. Appreciate y'all, and I will see y'all next Sunday. <laughs>